All set? All right. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Joel Gilnett, pastor of Sudbury United Methodist Church. This is worship for our congregation and our community. On June 21, 2020, it's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to those who are dads in attendance and to those who are dads watching at home. Behind me in the red maple trees, there is a flag for every father in our congregation. And um, there is a flag both for fathers who are biological dads and also fathers who are spiritual dads because everybody knows that being a father is much more a matter of spiritual than biological. And so all of the men and the young men in our church are represented by the flags as we celebrate the gifts of fatherhood in our congregation on this special day. Today, uh, leading worship with me is uh, Chris Straub, our liturgist. Our musicians are Rob Hammerton and Tom Jero, and somewhere in the shadows. Hello, Kevin Murphy. Good morning to our guys. And Skyler is our tech today. We're grateful to him for all of his help as we broadcast once again with gratitude on Sudbury TV. Let us worship God. morning. I'm over here. I look like a defensive coordinator. <laughs> In the prelude time, we thought that we would rehearse for the offertory. And yes, what that means is we're all doing the offertory. It is we're going to work with the African American spiritual O Freedom, which if you're in the choir, you know very well. And if you're not in the choir, you probably know very well. And you'll know by the time we get done. However, uh, let's see, given the people here and where you are, that Carol King song so far away comes to mind. I would love to see if we can get the people who are underneath that tree where Susan Pauley is to be group one and everybody else to be group two. 
And we're gonna keep this simple this week and then we're gonna get it crazy as the weeks goes on. All you need is the instruments you brought with you. If you saw my video this week that I put up on Friday, you know what's coming or you have a sense of what's coming. If I could have Susan's group be the not hip group and what I mean by that is if you could clap on beat one and beat three and if the people back there could be the hip the group that claps on two and four and how we're gonna do that is this way. I'm gonna, no, I can't do that. I'm not gonna scream and yell. So here are the beats. We're grouping in with, into four. So it's gonna be one, two, three, four. This group, let's practice one and three clapping. One, two, and ready, I'll help. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. The people in the back are getting way ahead of me, that's good. Three, one, two, three. I'll put it to you this way, whatever you're comfortable with. At this time I have the feeling. Let's do two and four. Tell you what, everybody let's do two and four and then you can find out what you're comfortable with. One, two, ready, go. One, two, three, four. This is hip. Two, three, four. One, two. Cool. Now, pick one. Doesn't matter. Almost doesn't matter what it is as long as I have approximately the same numbers, maybe, or maybe not. Here we go. Pick one and stay with it and don't get drawn off by the other people. One, two, ready, and go. One, two, three, four. One, two. Okay, everybody wants to be hip. <laughs> Fine, let's do it that way. Everybody be hip. Two and four. This is better training anyway. Here we go. Good morning. I'm sorry. Uh, well, welcome to uh, Sudbury United Methodist Church. Uh, please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin this morning. Gladden the soul of your servant, O Lord, for to you I lift up my soul. And now join in the opening prayer, also printed in your bulletin. God of Abraham and Sarah, Hagar and Ishmael, thank you for the beauty of the land we share. Grant your protection to all who shelter here. Forgive the racism that has been part of our history, our disregard for pain and oppression. Take away our tunnel vision, open our hearts to care for each other direct our lives to just and peaceful action. Teach us to rejoice in you, whose image we see in our brothers and sisters, and by whose example in Christ we have known the breadth of your universal love. Amen.
Please stand for the reading from the Gospel of Matthew. This is from the 10th chapter of Matthew, verses 28 through 31. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. You may be seated. It's time for the children's time. And uh, if there are children watching at home, it's time to bring them close to the screen so that they can join us as we talk here on the playground this morning. Abby and Greg Bockweg are today's children's moment. <laughs> it's good to know where the stool is. Welcome, Abby and Greg. Happy Father's Day, Greg. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Inside the bag, there are some special gifts. Take them out one at a time, and uh, we will describe them to the congregation. Here comes the big gift. Those are like, whoops, I've lost my sound. Those are peanut butter M&Ms. And um, we're going to play a little guessing game in a moment. Also inside the bag, two three by five cards, one for each of you, and two markers. Excellent. Now, Abby, make sure your dad gets to see the very important, yes. <laughs> this is when you write your guess. How many of those M&Ms are there in the jar? The one who is close wins the jar. The suspense is... Nerve-wracking. Abby was very quick to guess. Here comes Greg's guess. Who wants to go first? It's Father's Day. Dads go first. More than 50. More than 50. Oh, very cagey. Very cagey. And Abby, 265. Can you see the number? Oh my Lord. 265, right on the number. Wow. <laughs> Even Abby is shocked, right? <laughs> you win it legitimately. Wow, congratulations, well done. We're all astonished and happy for you. So now let me ask you the question that matters more than how many are in the jar. How many hairs are there on your head, Abby? More than 50, right? Yeah, that's right. That was your dad's answer. Jesus says that God knows the number of hairs on our heads. And you knew the number of M&Ms in the jar. Do you think God knew that too? Probably. You're not smarter than God. No. God knows us this much, right? God knows everything. But God doesn't use everything that God knows about us against us. God uses everything that God knows about us to keep track of us. Even sparrows that fall to the ground, God notices and God cares. And Jesus says, if God cares for sparrows, how much more does God care for us? Let's give thanks in prayer. 
Gracious God, you watch over all your children. Thank you for watching us so very closely and lovingly. Thank you on this Father's Day for dads who faithfully watch over us and care for us like you. And let us always know that we are surrounded by your blessing as we give thanks to you in Jesus' name. And all God's children say, amen. Thank you very much. Enjoy the M&Ms. Maybe she'll share with you, Greg. She will. <laughs> Let's reflect quietly for a moment on God's great love. Today's reading from the Old Testament, as we continue to walk through the book of Genesis, is found in chapter 21. We're going to begin at verse 8 and conclude at verse 21. Listen with me for the word of God. The child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son. For the son of this slave woman will not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of this slave woman... I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, Do not let me look on the death of this child. And she sat opposite him. She lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife from him for him from the land of Egypt. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Shh. 
She is probably the most important woman in American history who will always remain a mystery. Like Hagar in Genesis, her mystery and her ancestry are tied together. Hagar was an Egyptian. Did you know that? I didn't know it till last week. But Sarah, her grandparents, three of them were Europeans. The fourth was black. That grandmother, the fourth grandparent with African roots, is the reason Sarah was held in slavery until the day she died. Sarah's bedroom, how shall I say this? Sarah's bedroom was just a few steps from the main bedchamber on the main floor of the main house, which she was expected to visit, if you catch my drift, by slipping invisibly through a covered passageway. Those visits began when Sarah was 16 years old. Before the lady of the house died, which will sound even crazier when you find out that Sarah and the lady of the house were half sisters. Hagar and Abraham had a brief tryst. Sarah's visits with the plantation owner went on for 38 years. Don't even ask if it was love. Don't even ask if it was consensual. When you are being held in slavery, Hagar might remind us, nothing is consensual. Three years ago, Sarah's bedroom was discovered by accident when a men's room was being renovated on the south wing of the old plantation house. The archaeologist who examined the brick floor under the bathroom tiles, he said, hmm, looks like a cover-up to me. In the 1700s, the plantation owner said nothing, not one word about Sarah in his daily journals. The men's room at Monticello, it seems was just the latest attempt to keep Thomas Jefferson's 240-year secret. Though everyone knew that Sally Hemings' children, all six of them, all slaves, were given special treatment by their father, who famously wrote, all men are created equal. When you hold Sally Hemings and Hagar side by side next to each other, what you get is a tale of two very similar stories, both women held in slavery, both women taken into the master's bedroom, both women denied the dignity of a legitimate relationship for themselves and their children. The one part of the story that doesn't really match up is probably the biggest surprise in the whole book of Genesis. It would have been completely understandable if the writers who gave us the stories of Israel's forefathers decided to snip Hagar out of the picture, right? I mean, let's face it, today's reading from Genesis is deeply disturbing. This reading is ugly, tough to hear. Sarah looks like Ishmael's wicked stepmother. Abraham looks like a spineless, 
cruel father who would send his firstborn son and his son's mother into the desert with a bag of water and a loaf of bread. Thanks a lot. Happy Father's Day. If this story had been photoshopped, snipped out of the book of Genesis, Abraham would look a lot more heroic and Sarah would look like a model mother. So what's going on here? Why is this story a story inspired by the Holy Spirit, we Christians believe? Why is this story in the Bible? It would have been easy and tempting to leave it out. What does God want us to know about ourselves, about our relationship with each other? and about our relationship with God that would be left out of the picture if someone built a toilet over the place where Hagar used to sleep. For me, there are at least three ways to answer that question. First, the story of Hagar reminds us that even good people Good people like Sarah and Abraham, not to mention Thomas Jefferson. Even good people can be deeply, deeply self-centered. Humans are capable of doing anything to make our own lives better. And the lives of our own flesh and blood. For example, Sarah knew the rules. Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn son. Therefore, he was entitled to two-thirds of Abraham's fortune when he died. So Abraham used the woman she owned as if Hagar was a breed cow. She used Hagar to take her son and to collect Abraham's fortune for herself. But then when Sarah's Isaac came along, surprising her and the whole world, she was the one who threw Ishmael and that slave woman into the desert like a bag of trash with Abraham's cooperation. If Hagar's story had been photoshopped out of Genesis, we would have had one less warning to keep a very close eye on ourselves, on our tendency to use whatever power and control we have to get our own way. And yet that warning is not the whole picture. The story of Hagar is also a gospel story. This story is full of God's good news. When people crushed by power raise their voices in misery, God hears their cries and God responds. Whether it's Hagar's children or Sally Hemings' children, it doesn't matter. The story of Hagar reminds us that God will never abandon people who are cast like trash into school systems pretending to be equal but are anything but. God will never abandon people who are cast into legal systems bragging about justice but rigged to take care of the rich instead of the poor. And God will never abandon people who are cast into prison systems, claiming to be tough on crime, but functioning more like 21st century plantations for Sally Hemings' children. Ishmael is a gospel promise. His name is important. If you know Israel's most important prayer, 
Shema Israel, you will recognize the name that Hagar gave her son. Shema El Ishmael. It means God hears. God is not deaf. God is not distant. God hears every cry for justice. The blood of Abel crying from the ground. The son of Hagar, Rachel weeping for her children. The misery of God's people held as slaves in Egypt. And yet, once again, that's not the whole picture. The story of Hagar was and is too important to Photoshop out of Abraham's family portrait because it reminds us that ambition bears watching and God hears the cry of people in misery. As Jesus says in today's reading from Matthew's gospel, not one sparrow falls to the ground apart from God's notice. Even the hairs of your head are all counted. But there is another facet that makes the story of Hagar a Bible gem, a Bible keeper, instead of a Bible seeker to cover up under a bathroom floor. The lives of the privileged and the lives of those who are cast out by power are in reality in God's big picture, a tale of two stories, two interlocking narratives, each one so important to the other one, they must be told side by side. You probably heard what happened last week in London, right? A heroic act of bravery. On TV, the prime minister said, it represents the best of us. On Saturday, June 13th, Parliament Square looked like a war zone. The statue of Winston Churchill was up for grabs. Two lines of protesters formed a Black Lives Matters demonstration on one side and a horde of hooligans on the other side. We would call them skinheads, shouting racial slurs and waving Union Jacks. Suddenly, smoke gr grenades and flying objects filled the air, bricks and beer cans. On the flag waving side, a hooligan with a shaved head hit the ground bleeding profusely. On the Black Lives Matter side, five big guys lunged forward toward the hooligan. The biggest guy scooped the skinhead in his arms, threw him over one shoulder, and carried him behind the police line to safety, with his four mates running interference for him. We saved a life today, Patrick Hutchinson tweeted. He's the gym coach we saw in the pictures in the newspapers and on TV, a Brit of African descent who lugged the skinhead bleeding profusely to safety behind police lines. If we didn't do what we do, one of Hutchinson's four mates said, who knows what would have happened. They were patently racist. Boris Johnson said on TV about the skinheads, there is nothing that can excuse their behavior. Like black and white, 
in Britain and in America. Isaac and Ishmael is a tale of two stories. When Isaac's older son Esau was driven into the desert, Ishmael was there with a wife for a distant relative being treated like trash. When Jacob's sons became a great nation with 12 branches, God was there making Ishmael a great nation with 12 branches. And when Jacob's sons dumped their own brother, Joseph, to the bottom of a dry well, guess who was there? Ishmael's family, saving Joseph, delivering him to Egypt. In other words, if the writers of Genesis photoshopped Hagar and Ishmael out of the picture, if they tried to snip them out of Abraham's family portrait, a sparkling gem would have been spoiled. In this tale of two stories, we see dazzling proof, dazzling proof that God's love for all people is the same as our love for our own children or our own nieces and nephews. God loves all of us with no exceptions. No matter how many kids we have, is there any such thing really as the favorite? No matter how many kids we have, is our love chipped into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces? Or does it grow bigger and bigger each time the family grows? No matter how many kids we have, is it us versus them? Or is it we're all in this together? Each one helping the other one for the sake of God's whole family. Remember Sally Hemings? Her children are still waiting for this country, for their country, to answer all three of those questions. The story of Hagar and Ishmael is as clear as a diamond about God's answer for those questions. We are in it together. It is time for America's answer to those questions to be just as clear as God's. Amen. Let us reflect on God's word. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Please take your worship bulletins in hand and stand with me as we celebrate Father's Day by praying responsively the litany that is printed. Loving God, we pray today for the men among us and around us who give us a glimpse of your unflagging love. The fathers who have given us life and love, that we may show them respect. For fathers who have lost a child, that their faith 
may give them consolation and hope. For men who may or may not have children of their own, but who act like fathers to someone who needs to provide, support, nurture, and love. For stepfathers who have assumed that role with love and joy, who love someone else's children, creating new family ties. For absentee fathers who are unable to be a source of strength, who respond inadequately to their children's needs to sustain their families emotionally, spiritually, or financially. Fathers who struggle with temptation, violence, or addiction. For those who do harm and for those who may not harm. For new fathers, full of hope, for long-time fathers full of wisdom, for future fathers yet to be, and fathers soon to be. Men who have shaped our lives without the ties of family or children, for brothers in Christ who have taught us guided us and guided us to the truth. O oh God, our Father, in wisdom and love you have made all things. Bless these men among us and around us, that they may be strengthened to love, nurture, and guide others. Let the example of their faith and fortitude beckon us like these flags to celebrate the creativity they display, display as bearers of your image. Teach us, their daughters and sons, to honor them always with unflagging respect. We pray for these blessings through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The piece we're going to offer for you is a piece called Trouble Soon Be Over. It was brought to us by our friend Russ Dowdy a number of years ago. It's probably more effective as a sacred piece of music with the words, but we're going to do it without singing because that's the rule. Welcome once again to worship. I'm Joel Gilmack, pastor of Sudbury United Methodist Church. We are worshiping together on the playground behind the church on Father's Day, June 21st. Grateful for everybody who is participating here on the playground. The shade tree is really popular today. 
looking forward to joining you in just a few more minutes. Grateful also for your continuing support for the ministries of our congregation and your faithfulness during a time of extreme challenge. Let us listen as uh, Chris Straub shares this week's concerns and celebrations. Grateful for today's celebration of Father's Day, let us pray that God's love, faithfulness, and care will be the model for fathers everywhere. Grateful for, for the nation we live in, let us pray that God will fulfill all will fill all the, of our leaders with wisdom, integrity, and righteousness. Grateful for all who risk their lives to protect the health and safety of others, let us pray that God will guide them in paths of mercy, bravery, and justice, and heal them when they fail in their duties. Remembering all those lives are shadowed by pain, suffering, or sorrow, let us play pray that God will raise them up from the dark valleys of anxious times into the shelter of God's light, life, and love. Remember all, remembering all who feel broken by a failing economy, let us pray for families stressing, stressed to the break, breaking point, business owners facing foreclosure or bankruptcy, farmers, fishers, ranchers, and truckers, that they may know the joy of God's saving help. Remembering how much our lives, communities, public institutions, and cultural habits desperately need, desperately need repentance and renewal, let us pray that God's desire for love, kindness, and generosity will replace hatred, suspicion, prejudice, and contempt. Eleanor Surian wants us to know that she is praying for our church and all her friends here. During a visit with Pastor Joel last Friday, she said, God is our best hope with this terrible virus to keep us all safe. I pray for people who have no faith to lean on. Cheryl Cook asked prayers for her friend Nick, who is undergoing painful cancer treatment. Near, after nearly two weeks, he was home from the hospital one day when a dreadful reaction sent him back to the hospital. Please ask the Lord to help Nick. This has been a very long and painful road. Pastor Joel's mother, Jewel, is back in the hospital this weekend after a few days at home. Gallbladder, gallbladder issues again. Please pray for good results as her doctors try again. Ruth Bryden gives thanks for her friend, Tom Kraut a former member of our church who now lives in Maine. On June 23rd, Tom turns 92. His daughter is grateful to everyone who sent her dad a birthday card. So far, more than 70. Jamie will visit Tom outside his assisted living facility on Tuesday for the first time since the virus shut him in. And finally, Cindy and Greg Bockwig celebrated the seventh anniversary of Abby's adoption last week. She has been our joy and blessing, they say, for her entire life, and we are looking forward to the path ahead. Let us pause for a moment to add our own personal prayer celebrations and concerns to those that Chris has shared with us, and then I will lead in prayer. Oh God, you know the hairs on our heads. You know the sparrows that fall to the ground. You see the big picture. While we tend to pay attention to things that are closest to us. Remind us today to keep an eye on ourselves and our own motives. While listening with you to the cries of those who suffer in pain. Make us responsive like you are 
so that we may join you in your ministry to bind all the stories of the world into one great story through Jesus Christ, your son. Remember, we pray the needs of our world as we continue as a human race to seek wisdom and a cure for the virus that still spreads rapidly near and far. Bless those efforts, hear our cries, so that illness and dying may cease and this pandemic finally be resolved. Hear us as we pray for economies near and far trying to reopen so that no further financial damage is done. Oh God, care for those who are without the resources needed to care for themselves and their own families and bless us in our sharing with others so that all may know the fullness of your love. Remember, we pray the ill, those who suffer physical, emotional and psychological pain today. Hold them tenderly in your arms. Assure them that you will hear and respond. Rejoice with us, O God, as we give thanks for our fathers and for all who have given the gift of fatherly love to their own children or to children who are theirs through ties of friendship and baptismal commitment. Gracious God, we are fragile. We are barely able to walk on our own two feet. We rely on you to hold us up and to guide our paths in straight lines. Show us the way. Remind us again that you gave us Jesus, his life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection, to provide a roadmap and consolation when we fail, forgiveness when we sin, and new life when we perish. We pray in the name of Christ, who teaches us always and everywhere to come to you like your children, Whenever we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our offertory, as we, as we mentioned, instruments up, <laughs> two and four. Thank you. 
morning's stewardship moment is a uh, reminder to mark your calendar for the church conference at 11.30 a.m. on June 28th. Next Sunday, uh, June 28th, members of Sudbury UMC are urged to participate in the annual spring church conference. We will start at 11.30 a.m. The meeting will take place online via Zoom. Access codes will be mailed to eligible members. You may connect by computer or telephone. The conference booklet will be available after worship today. Print copies will be here at the church, uh, or they'll be uh, available electronically on our church uh, website. The agenda for the sem semi-annual meeting will include voting for the chairpersons and commission members recruited by the Committee on Nominations and Leadership Development. Uh, receiving written reports at the end of the 2019-2020 program year, updating the 2020 budget, uh, and amending the charter of the Permanent Endowment Committee. The Reverend Megan Stowe, Superintendent of the Central Massachusetts District, will preside. Only business in harmony with a call to conference will be tra transacted. We have promised to support our church with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Let us give ourselves to God by attending the church conference next Sunday, June 28th, by sending our gifts to the church office, and by praying each day for the mission we share in the world. Please stand with me so that we may give God our praise saying together the doxology from Charles Wesley, one of our founding Methodist fathers. God of all, thy love we praise, love which gave thy son to die. Jesus, full of truth and grace, thee alike we glorify. Spirit, comforter divine, praise by all to thee be given, till we in full chorus join when this earth is changed for heaven. Let us pray. Wondrous God, keeper of the universe, you find time to whisper your love to us. We come before you with grateful hearts. When you speak your love into our quiet moments, it is the most precious gift to all of us. It is not a gift for us to hold and hide, but to proclaim from the housetops. May the gifts we offer to you this morning proclaim your love loudly to the world that too often feels forgotten. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, go forth in peace, love God, and serve your neighbor in all that you do. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Amen.
Appreciate it, Skyler. Yeah.